Hi, I'm Kevin Hartley and welcome to Kevin Hartley Photography in my office. This is a channel that I've set up to share my experiences of wildlife and nature with others. So let's go. When I first started um, my journey into wildlife photography, um, I made this mistake of trying to run before I could walk. Sharing that experience and the knowledge I've had since then, what I want to do, and this is the first time I've done this type of video, uh, I'm going to do a three part video all about understanding exposure. And this video, part one, is all to do with the most basic aspect of photography uh, and that's the exposure triangle. When I first started looking at exposure, <laughs> Went from everything from exposure metering, exposure triangle, exposure compensation, exposure values, manual exposure, automatic exposure, overexposure, underexposure. It's just it's just a minefield of exposure, and trying to take it all in um, at one time it was just too much. So, what I want to do in this video is share with you uh, my understanding of the exposure triangle, and what we'll do is we'll look at what exposure means. And then we'll look at the exposure triangle and we'll break it down to its three constituent parts. The aperture, the shutter speed and the ISO. And what we'll do is we'll actually build an exposure triangle together. So, what does exposure mean? Well, exposure is the amount of light that reaches the camera sensor, thereby creating visual data over a period of time. So it's all about light. As we've said, the exposure triangle is made up of three component parts. The aperture which is really the artistic part of your exposure and that deals with the, the depth of field and I'll explain that in a, a little bit of detail later. We'll look at the shutter speed which we use in wildlife photography for, for either two things, either freezing the motion or blurring the motion to slow things down. And then finally ISO which is all about the sensor controlling the amount of light that's available at that time and thereby leading to a good quality image and the danger there is noise and again I'll explain what that means. A properly exposed image is produced when the aperture, the shutter speed and the ISO are all balanced with the available light. The challenge in wildlife photography is to find a combination that eliminates the following. Unwanted motion blur through shutter speed, providing the right depth of field to make sure that we get a subject in focus and finally that we don't capture excess noise through ISO. So what is the aperture? Well the aperture is the size of the opening of the lens. The larger the aperture the more light gets into the camera and vice versa the smaller the aperture less light gets into the camera. All apertures are measured in f-stops and f-stop numbers. It's kind of back to front really. The larger the aperture the smaller the f-stop number. So a large aperture would be something like f2.8 and a small aperture would be something like f22. Kind of back to front really, but that's the way it is. Two things we need to remember about apertures is that the larger the aperture is, the narrower the depth of field is. And I'll, I'll show you a picture and a diagram of what we mean about depth of field, especially for wildlife photography and how important it is to understand it. Smaller the aperture, the wider your depth of field is going to be. When it comes to myself personally, I have two lenses. I have a f4.5 to f7.1 zoom lens, Canon 100 to 500, and I also have the Canon RF 800, which is a fixed f11. Now, on the 800mm lens, that means that the aperture is open at f11 and I can't adjust it. It stays at f11 all the time. With regards to typical apertures that we use in wildlife photography, we're talking, I would suggest, anything between f2.8 up to about f11. Those are That's the range of the apertures that we can use in wildlife photography or, or, or are recommended. The optimum apertures are around about f5.6 up to about f8. What one to use? Well, that depends on the lens you've got, the apertures that you've got available and the subject that you're photographing. But typically with the two lenses I have, I always shoot at f7.1 or f8 on the 100 to 500 
800mm, I've got no option, I have to shoot f11 and I don't have any problem with that. One recommendation in, in wildlife photography is that there's what we aim to do is really to focus on our subject and get our subject to stand out or pop out and, and, and that's the aim of the photograph. And what you're looking to do is blur out your foreground and your background so that your subject pops out and your subject sits in that depth of field, which is what we're going to move on to next. So, what do we mean by the depth of field? The depth of field is the zone of acceptable sharpness with an image that will appear in focus. So what does that mean? Well, if you have a look at this picture that I took of a great crested grebe, if we look at the dotted line at the bottom, up to that dotted line, the image is out of focus. From the, dotted, the bottom dotted line to the top dotted line, the image is in focus. And from the top dotted line all the way to the background, it's out of focus. So between the dotted lines is what's known as the depth of field. And that's where we want our subject to be. And that's where we're focusing on the subject so that we blur out the foreground and we blur out the background at the same time. There's three things that affect the depth of field. The focal length of your lens, the size of the aperture that you're using, and the distance between you and the subject. When it comes to the focal length, the longer the focal length, the narrower the depth of field. So on large lenses, like an 800mm lens that I'm using, I know that I'm going to have a narrow depth of field where the image is in focus. However, on wider lenses, like landscape photographers, they want their image to be in focus from the front all the way to, back, to the back, so they use wider lenses and they produce a wider depth of field. So how does the aperture affect the depth of field? Well, the larger the aperture, the narrower the depth of field. The smaller the aperture, the wider the depth of field. So typically, as I suggested, from a wildlife point of view, we will be using apertures in the region of between f2.8 up to about f11. Optimum being around about 7.18. And they provide a narrow depth of field. So how does distance affect the depth of field? Well, the nearer you are to your subject, the narrower the depth of field is. So the further you are away from your subject, the wider your depth of field is. Now, as wildlife photographers, we want to get as near to our subject as possible. So you'll see that from a wildlife photography point of view, because of the size of the lenses that we use, <coughs> excuse me, the focal length, the apertures that we need trying to blur out the, the foreground and the background and the distance by getting close to our subject that predominantly we're always working with narrow depths of field. So that's something you need to be aware of in wildlife photography. So just to summarise um, the aperture, there, there's, there's no single one-stop, f-stop um, you should use for any given scene. You have to balance all three aspects of the exposure triangle together. But typically in wildlife photography you'll find that what they call shooting wide open is the norm. In other words having a, a, a wide open aperture. One point to, to, to take into consideration is the fact that most lenses are at the sharpest. So for instance on my 7.1 500mm uh, zoom lens, Canon 100-500, wide open with the lens at 500 millimeters is 7.1, but I can get f8, and actually <coughs> the lens is a little bit sharper at f8. So typically, lots of lenses are like that. So it's something to take into consideration. And as I said, remember it's a balance between all three sides of the exposure triangle that matters. For me personally, wildlife photography is the most challenging genre in photography. Well, why is that? You may ask. Well, our subject, wildlife, have a mind of their own. We're not in control of them, they're in control of themselves. And unlike landscape photography, where your subject's never going to move, portrait photography in a studio where everything's under the direct control of the photographer, as wildlife photographers, uh, it's more challenging. That's, that's my opinion. Next thing we're going to move on to in the exposure triangle is shutter speed. And shutter speed is the speed with which the camera shutter opens and closes. And during that time, the amount of light that is then allowed to enter into the camera onto the sensor. What fast shutter speeds do in wildlife photography is they allow us to actually freeze the motion 
or the action of our subject. Whilst slow shutter speeds are used to blur motion and for panning objects, fast shutter speeds are, are also helpful when we want to capture perfectly mid motion subjects like birds in flight. One point to note on modern day cameras and, and, and mirrorless camera systems is that image stabilization is built into the lens and, and it's also built into the camera. And what that does is it allows you to use slower shutter speeds which in turn helps you to use wider apertures and also it allows you to control your ISO and thereby allowing more light into the camera. So you need to be make sure that whatever lens that you're using if you're using image stabilization, it allows you to use slightly slower shutter speeds. Even with the image stabilization, you need to be careful at certain shutter speeds. And you may need to support your camera uh, on a tripod or a bean bag to aid that stabilization. There's a simple rule, which is one of the, the basics of photography, and certainly in, in wildlife photography, and that's known as the reciprocal rule. Now that basically means that if you're using a 400 millimeter lens then your minimum shutter speed should be 1 400th of a second and an example that you, you'll see here uh, I took this picture of a, a grey squirrel handheld so minimum shutter speed 1 500th of a second so what I just want to do now is just cover with you some typical um, recommended shutter speeds and um, that we, we use in wildlife photography and I think they're handy for beginners to remember First one we're going to look at is this Kingfisher, which uh, I took um, the Kingfisher sitting in rain. Now Kingfishers, what normally happens is they will land and they will sit absolutely motionless. So they're not moving at all, apart from breathing. And it allows you to use quite slow shutter speeds. In this instance it was actually raining and what I've done is I've actually lowered the, the shutter speed down uh, to actually catch the motion of the rain in the picture. The next picture is a picture of a red grouse uh, which I took up in the Peak District in Derbyshire in England and this was I was lying down in the heather and had my camera supported on a bean bag. Because it was supported on a bean bag and with the light available I was able to use a shutter speed of about 1 250th of a second. So if you're supporting your, your camera you can get it probably down to about 1 250th of a second for a static subject. Then we have as I just mentioned earlier the reciprocal rule size of your lens equals the length of your shutter speed and in this instance 1 500th of a second for a 500 millimeter lens. Next one is a picture of a Jay in flight or a bird birds in flight and you're looking at shutter speeds round about well this one was at 1 2 thousandths of a second. Depending on the size of the bird, the larger the bird the slower they tend to fly. So things like herons and swans you probably get away with 1 thousand a second, 1 thousand 250 of a second something like that. Uh, but in this instance it was one two thousandths of a second. And finally this picture of a dragonfly. So things like small insects and, and small birds, fast birds like kingfishers, swallows, you're looking uh, at shutter speeds up to about one four thousandths of a second. Okay the final side of the exposure triangle is to do with the ISO. And the ISO refers to the sensitivity of the camera sensor to light. Now low ISO, generally speaking, results in more detailed and quality of your image. Whereas a high ISO can result in less detail and it also introduces what's known as noise or grain into the image. As can be seen in this picture with the, the red squirrel. Increasing your ISO normally allows you to use a higher shutter speed or a smaller aperture but the danger with the ISO is always noise in your image. Having said that, modern day cameras can deal with noise incredibly well. I've got one or two pictures that will show you, one of a marsh tit and one of a blue tit that were taken at relatively high ISOs and with software you can deal with them uh, relatively straightforward. As wildlife photographers, the best times of day to go out and photograph wildlife are at first light and last light when there's not a lot of light about and then we tend to have to use or you will have to use higher ISOs to get the pictures that you're after but as I said modern day cameras and software can deal with it relatively well. So as I've stated noise can reduce the quality of your image it's best to keep your ISO as low as possible to keep your image sharp and there's a little saying 
ISO keep it low. So just to summarise on the exposure triangle, it consists of three aspects in relation to wildlife photography. We're talking about the aperture, looking at our depth of field, making sure that our subject that sits in that depth of field is in focus. And here's a picture of a stag. You'll see that the foreground's blurred out, the background's blurred out, but the, the, the actual stag itself is sitting in that depth of field. Shutter speed we use for action or freezing the motion. And we have a pic picture of a kingfisher, and this was shot at four thousandths of a second. And finally, ISO, which is all about the, the quality and the noise that can get into your image. Uh, and this blue tip was actually shot at 20,000 ISO. Uh, and by using um, software, I use DxO Pure Lab 6, I can deal with that in my, my post processing. Okay, thanks for watching this part one of my three part series on understanding exposure. What we'll do uh, in part two is we'll look at the next step. And as I said at the beginning, it's all about taking it step by step. Get to know what the exposure triangle is all, all about. Once you're happy with that, then move on to the next thing. Don't try to try like I did in the beginning to run before you can walk. And in part two, We'll look at exposure metering, we'll look at exposure histograms. All I'd ask is that if you've liked this video, could you hit the like button? And also, if you've not uh, subscribed to my channel, Kevin Hartley Photography, could I ask you to consider doing so? It's completely free. Uh, it just helps me to grow my channel and it's something that I love to do, uh, is share my experience uh, and knowledge with other people. And I'm always learning. I learn all the time. I just don't stop learning. That's what it's all about. So, until the next time, stay safe, take care, and I hope to see you soon. Bye for now.